Part of being a successful web designer is having the ability to create engaging user experiences within the context of your design. User expectations for online experiences have changed dramatically over the years, and designing your sites to meet these expectations increasingly means adding levels of interactivity to your pages. Most interactive elements on the web are driven through a combination of CSS and JavaScript and depending upon their functionality they can become pretty complex. It should go without saying that learning JavaScript is one of the best things that you can do to improve the interactivity and functionality of your sites. Scripting however is not for everyone and thankfully Dreamweaver includes plenty of tools that allow you to add JavaScript based interactivity and functionality to your site without having to know any JavaScript at all. In Dreamweaver you can use the behaviors panel to add pre-built scripts to your page or you can take advantage of the built-in Spry integration to add richer user experiences to your site through Adobe's own Ajax framework. In this movie, we'll focus on using behaviors. Now I have the gallery.htm file open, and this is a little photo gallery that we'll be building in this chapter. I'm previewing it in live view so we can kind of see the functionality of this photo gallery and what it can do for us. Notice that when we click on one of the thumbnails, the image loads, and as the images are loading, they kind of fade in a little bit. And another nice touch is that just below the thumbnails, there's a little link for more. And if I hover over that, I get a nice little tool tip that tells me a little bit more about that photo from the individual that took it. Our photo gallery offers some pretty compelling user experiences. As we will see in this chapter, Dreamweaver gives us all the tools we need to build interactive elements like this one without having to know any JavaScript at all. So I'm going to turn Live View off. And I just want to go down and click on one of the thumbnails, and I'm going to open up my Behaviors panel. Now, your Behaviors panel will typically be found in your panel dock, but the easiest way to find it is just to go up to Windows and choose Behaviors, right there towards the middle. You'll notice it's docked in with the Tag Inspector, so it goes back and forth from the attributes of the tag that you're looking at to the behaviors attached to that item. Well, in this case, I can see that the thumbnail that I have selected has what we call a swap image behavior. And we're going to take a look at using the swap image behavior in just a moment. You can also see that just beside that, it says on click. That, of course, is the action that's going to be triggering this behavior, in this case, clicking on the thumbnail. Well, if I want to add a behavior to any element that I have on the page, all I really need to do is focus on that element and click the Add Behavior menu. As I do that, I see a list of available behaviors for that particular type of object. Now, this might change based on whether it's a link or a graphic, or what type of element it is, but you're going to see a populated menu here with all the things that you can do. In this case, we have swap image, pop-up messages, open browser windows, all sorts of fairly basic JavaScript behaviors that are going to allow you to automate some of the processes that would otherwise require you to know JavaScript. Now, once a behavior has been applied, you can go back and edit it at any time. For example, I could come in and choose a different type of mouse interaction or interaction for this behavior. I could even double click the behavior itself and bring up a dialog box that lets me change the behavior of this element and any other elements that are affected by it. I don't want to change this one, so I'm just going to hit cancel. The behaviors panel makes it easy to add complex interactivity to your site and easy to control and edit your scripts throughout the development process. Even better, no JavaScript knowledge is required at all, and that's a definite plus for those who are new to web design or have no scripting experience. One of the most common interactive page elements is the ubiquitous image rollover. Dreamweaver's swap image behavior allows us to create image rollovers by selecting an image and choosing which image to replace it with when that image is interacted with. While this is normally used for image-based links, the swap image behavior is flexible enough to allow for some pretty cool creative exploration. In this movie, we're going to create an image gallery that relies on the swap image behavior to change a larger image when a thumbnail is selected. This behavior is often called a disjointed rollover, where interacting with one image causes another image on the page to change. So I have the gallery.htm file open. If I scroll down, it looks like our gallery is already finished. Well, the layout's finished, so the CSS is finished, and the structure of the gallery is put together. However, it is currently static, meaning if the, we interact with it at all, nothing really happens. So our gallery is, for the most part, finished, we just need to add the interactivity now. So the first thing I'm going to do is go through and name all of my images. Anytime that you're going to have JavaScript interact with elements on the page, 
those elements need to have an ID or a name attribute. So what I'm going to do is go up to my default large photo and click on that. And looking in my properties inspector, I can see in the upper left-hand corner a space for ID. So I'm going to select that, and then I'm going to type in photo large, all one word, photo large, lowercase p, uppercase l. Now, not only does naming this image allow us to control it through the use of JavaScript, but it's going to make it a lot easier for us to work with these images once we get in the swap image behavior as well. And you'll see what I'm talking about in just a moment. Next, I'm going to click on each of the thumbnails. And one at a time, I'm just going to call them thumb number one, thumb two, remember all one word, no spaces here, thumb three, and finally, thumb four. So anytime you're doing any type of an image rollover or swap image behavior, that's really step number one. You go in, select the images that you want to affect, and make sure that you give them a unique name. So all those names have to be unique. We couldn't have just said thumbs, for example, for the thumbnails. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and select the first thumbnail image. This is the Golden Gate Bridge. And although the larger Golden Gate Bridge photo is currently open, if somebody were interacting with the other thumbnails, obviously we want to be able to bring that one back. So I'm going to select that. I'll go over to my Behaviors panel. Now again, if you can't find your Behaviors panel, go up to Window and choose Behaviors. I'm going to grab the plus symbol, and I'm going to go down to Swap Image right there. As swap image comes up, the wisdom of naming this image becomes readily apparent to us. Notice that if we don't name them, they're just called unnamed IMG, and there's no way for us to know who's who. Now, we don't want to swap the thumbnail image out. We want to change the larger photo. So I'm going to make sure I highlight image, photo large, and then all I have to do is browse it to the photo that I want to use. So I'm going to select browse. I'm going to go into images, and inside that, we have a folder called gallery underscore interact. I'm going to open that up and there are all my photos. Now I'm going to change this to a detail view because it's just going to be a little bit easier for me to scroll through this. I'm looking for this bridge underscore large dot jpeg. So bridge underscore large. When I find that I'm going to click OK and I'm tempted to go ahead and click OK again but I've got a couple of other options here I need to talk about first. The first one is preload images. Anytime you're doing a swap image behavior I recommend going ahead and preloading those images on the page. It'll prevent any type of image flicker when you roll over an image for the first time or when you select an image for the first time. However, do be aware that preloading images means that all of the images in your gallery are going to be loaded as the page loads. If you have a large image gallery, then that can dramatically slow down your page load time. I also want to deselect restore images on mouse out. When I mouse over the thumbnail and click on it, I want the image to show up. I don't want to bring the other image back once I've moused off of the thumbnail. I want that image to persist. So that's good. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And I can see in my tag inspector there is my swap image behavior. Now notice that for the swap image behavior, the default action for that is on mouse over. So somebody rolling over this thumbnail, for example, with the mouse. That's not what we want. We want this image to only load if somebody clicks on the thumbnail. So I'm going to grab that pull down menu right there. And I'm going to choose on click. So now my behavior says on click, swap image, and that is all there is to that. It is really that simple. I'm going to go through each image and just repeat that process. So I'm going to select the olives, grab the pull down menu, and choose swap image. Again, be very careful and make sure you're selecting image photo large. We don't want to swap out the thumbnails. For this one, I'm going to set the source to olive large. And again, I'm going to remember to deselect restore images on mouse out. After I click OK, I'm going to remember to change the action to on click. I'll do the bird next. We'll go ahead and select that. Do swap image. Again, making sure that we're doing photo large. I'm going to browse and find the bird large. I'm going to turn off restore images on mouse out and click OK. And then finally change on mouse over to on click. You can get into a rhythm doing this, but it's also sometimes dangerous because you get into that rhythm and you just start clicking and you kind of forget what you're doing. Your mind starts to wander on you if you have a lot of these thumbnails. So take your time, go slowly, and focus. You want to make sure you're going to get this right the first time. I'm going to go ahead and select the oranges thumbnail. Once again, I'm going to grab the pull down menu and choose swap image, photo large, browse, and I want to do the oranges large. Click OK. Turn off restore images on mouse out and change that to on click. Now, as I mentioned, you want to make sure you get this right the first time, 
but that's really just to save yourself the time and effort of having to go back and do it again. The nice thing about these behaviors is that once you set them, you can go back and edit them at any time. So if you do get one wrong, don't feel like you have to start this project all over again. You can simply click the thumbnail, come over and double click the behavior itself, and change anything that you need to change. Notice that there's a little asterisk beside photo large. That's telling you who's swapping out. You could swap out multiples if you wanted to, but if you saw that asterisk beside the thumbnail, you'd know something was wrong, and you would just want to remove that and set it back for photo large. Same thing for the trigger action. At any time, you could come and click that and choose any other action that you'd want. Now, I'm going to go ahead and save this file, and I'm going to preview this in my browser. If I scroll down into the gallery now, as I click on these different thumbnails, my images are loading, and I'm getting the image I expect. Awesome. Now, the gallery's basic functionality is, for the most part, finished, but I want to point out something about these images. Notice that if you mouse over the image, your cursor doesn't change. It just stays as that arrow. That's really not helping the user out at all. If somebody were just to browse over these thumbnails, they might think that they wouldn't be clickable because they're not getting any feedback from the browser. So what we're going to do next is go in and make a very simple change to the CSS that's going to help us set some user expectations about these thumbnails. So I'm going to close my browser and go back into Dreamweaver. Now, anytime you're trying to access CSS that's in a fairly complex section of code, the easiest way to do it is through the code navigator. So what I'm going to do is hold down my Alt key, and if you're on the Mac, you can hold down your Option and Command key, and I'm going to click on one of the thumbnails. It does not matter which one. You'll notice that we have a rule that says pound main content, pound photo gallery, dot thumb, space IMG. So there's the image tag. That's who we're looking for. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And it's going to open that up in split view. Now, I'm just going to hand code this because this is incredibly easy to do. So go find this rule. Notice it's on line 862 of the main CSS. I'm just going to create a blank line at the end of this, making sure that I'm staying inside these curly braces. And I'm going to type in cursor colon pointer. Pointer is going to give us that hand, and it's going to let people know that, hey, you can interact with these elements. So I'll go ahead and save that. Test that again. And now as I scroll down, now I'm getting some feedback that, yes, these items are clickable, and that's going to lead to a much nicer gallery experience for your viewers. The swap image behavior just saved us a ton of time, did it not? And even better, it wrote all of the JavaScript necessary for our disjointed rollover so that we didn't have to. If I go back into Dreamweaver, flip over to source code, click on one of these thumbnails, and switch to source code, you can see what I'm talking about. You've got all these on clicks, mm swap images, and if we scroll up, we even have more JavaScript added to the head of our document. So I think it's pretty easy to see that using behaviors, you can create complex user interactions for your site without ever having to write the first line of code yourself. Even if you're brand new to web design, you have probably heard of the term AJAX. AJAX stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML and is the term that best describes the loose confederation of XML, JavaScript, CSS, dynamic HTML, and XHTML that is currently transforming the web experience. If that alphabet soup sounds intimidating, don't worry. Standardized AJAX libraries like Prototype and jQuery have emerged to make the process of creating these types of pages easier. Adobe has its own AJAX library called Spry. Spry is a set of CSS and JavaScript files that make building interactive applications easier. To make utilizing Spry accessible to all designers, Adobe has integrated many Spry-based tools directly into Dreamweaver. When using Spry objects like Spry Form Validation Widgets and the Spry Tooltip Widget, Dreamweaver will add all the necessary code to your page and copy over any necessary external CSS and JavaScript files to your site. So just as a way of looking at what we're going to be doing with Spry in just a moment, I have the gallery.htm file open. I want to go up and show you where to find your Spry objects within Dreamweaver. If you look at the Insert panel and click on the Spry tab, you're going to see the following list of icons. Now, these are broken up into three sections. The first section deals with Spry data and getting HTML and XML data onto the page. The second section deals with form validation, and it can make creating interactive forms a snap. The last section are our Spry widgets. You'll notice we have menu bars, tabbed panels, the tooltips that we're going to be using. The Spry widgets are basically user interface objects that allow you to show data in a pretty unique and interesting way. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to turn Live View on, 
And then I'm just going to scroll down to our photo gallery. And again, if I hover over one of these more links, you'll notice that I get a little bit of information about that photo. I can get the caption and the quote from the actual photographer that explains where the shot was taken, that sort of thing. Well, this is the Spry Tooltip widget, and it's remarkably easy to use. I want to show you a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes when you add a Spry widget to your page. I'm going to turn Live View off, and I'm going to switch to Code View. The Spry widgets themselves are extremely unobtrusive. You'll notice if I move up to the top of the page in Code View, I have a single link to an external JavaScript file that contains all the JavaScript necessary for the functionality of my tooltip widget. Compare that to the behavior that adds the JavaScript code directly to the head of your document. This is a little cleaner and a little bit more standards compliant. Now if I scroll a little bit further down the page towards the bottom, you can see right here I'm initializing all of those Spry tooltip widgets. Now, could you do this by hand? Absolutely. If you feel like hand coding these, you can all day long. But through the use of the insert panel and Dreamweaver's design view, you can do all of that without writing any code yourself. Now I want to point out one more thing about using Spry widgets that's incredibly important. If I look over at my files panel, I can see I have a folder right here called Spry Assets. When I open that up, here are all the external files, JavaScript files, CSS, that go into the functionality and the presentation of my widgets. Now when I go to upload my site, that Spry Assets folder needs to be uploaded as well. It's also a folder that you don't really want to move around a lot. All the files in your site that use your Spry widgets are going to be linking into that folder. So if you move it, number one, make sure you update everything, but number two, make sure you don't move it a lot, because if that link is severed, your widgets will no longer work. Dreamweaver's Spry integration helps put complex Ajax interactivity in the hands of all designers. Using Spry objects and widgets is a great way to introduce yourself to working within larger Ajax frameworks. The Spry CSS and JavaScript is entirely customizable, so as you get more comfortable with how those technologies work, you'll begin finding ways to customize them and make them your own. As we've discussed in some of our previous movies, Spry widgets are advanced user interface controls that allow you to present your content in compelling ways. The widgets are constructed of clean HTML and styled through fully customizable CSS. The widgets available in Dreamweaver through the insert panel are the Spry menu bar, tabbed panels, the accordion widget, collapsible panels, and the Spry tooltip widget. The Spry tooltip widget is one of my favorite Spry objects, and it's the one we're going to use in this example. It can add a huge punch to your site and is extremely easy to work with. The Spry tooltip works by allowing you to have a trigger object, usually a link or an image, cause a tooltip to appear somewhere else on your page. The contents, appearance, location, and behavior of the tooltip are totally customizable and can be made to integrate seamlessly into your design. In this movie, we will use the Spry tooltip widget to display more information about the photos in our gallery. So I have the gallery.htm file open from the 1405 folder, and I want to scroll down into my gallery, and I've got these little links that I want to act as the trigger for the tooltip, those more links. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight the word more. And it's okay also if you just click inside the word and use the tag selector to select the A tag. That's fine. Or you can highlight the word. Either way, it does not matter. I'm going to go right up to my insert panel, and I'm going to make sure I'm looking at the Spry category. And I'm just going to click once on the Spry tooltip right there. That's it. I've added a Spry tooltip. Now I need to do that three more times. I'm going to highlight the text. Add a Spry tooltip. Again, I can do that through the Properties Inspector. Even easier, simply by clicking in the link, clicking the Tag Selector, clicking the tooltip. There you go. Now we're done. Well, not quite. What's happened is, further down the page, we're going to see, if we scroll down a little bit, the Spry tooltips that just were added to the page. So when you're not in the browser and the JavaScript and CSS aren't currently interacting with each other, the Spry tooltip is basically just added below all your other content. Now that means if somebody has JavaScript disabled in their browser, they're literally going to see the content right down here at the bottom of the page just like that. So you may want to consider in the long run looking at how to provide alternate content for people that don't have JavaScript enabled. Now in order to save us a little bit of time, in the interest of time, one of the things I've done is placed all the tooltip captions down here below the tooltips themselves. So they're just sitting in paragraphs down here. Sometimes when you have multiple tooltips, the toughest part is figuring out what goes where. 
notice that the first tooltip that we added to the page is at the bottom of the stacking order. So I'm going to go down, find my bottom caption, which is this shot was sent in by Samara IODC. I'm just going to go ahead and highlight all of that text, and I'm just going to cut it. So that would be Control X or Command X. Then I'm going to go to the Spry tooltip 1. Again, that's the bottom one. I'm going to highlight the default text, and I'm going to paste just to place that into my tooltip. I need to do that for each of these guys. So I'm going to highlight the text for the next one, cut it, move up to my tooltip, and I'm just going to go up in order and paste it to replace that default text. Same thing for my next one. And then finally, I'm going to grab Max Smith sends in a picture from Orange Grove. I'll cut that one and paste that one in the tooltip as well. The result of that is going to be a couple of empty paragraphs down at the bottom of the page. So I'm going to scroll down, click in that bottom paragraph, and I'm just going to keep hitting delete until I get back to my tooltips. I don't want to delete any of the tooltips, so be careful about that. But I don't want a bunch of empty paragraphs down at the bottom of my page either. I'm going to go ahead and save this file. And as soon as I do that, notice that Dreamweaver says, hey, wait a second, you've used a Spry tooltip widget. I need the external CSS and the external JavaScript in order to make that widget work. So I'm going to copy that to your site. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And I notice that now we have a brand new folder. And I may have to refresh my site to get that. But I have a brand new folder called Spry Assets. And those guys are located right there. Now, occasionally, you may not want them to go into the Spry Assets folder. You may already have a scripts folder that you want them to move inside of. Or you may have another destination within your site that you want those to go. Well, if you go to your site setup dialog box, and remember, you can get there by simply clicking the name of the site itself right over here in the Files panel. You can go down to your advanced settings, and one of those settings is Spry. You can tell exactly which directory to use when placing Spry assets on the page. Currently, we have it set to the default, but you can set that anywhere that you'd like. Okay, so after I've saved that, I'm going to go ahead and preview that in my browser. And now, if I hover over one of those links, now I see my tooltip. Well, okay, it doesn't look great, but at least it's functional. So the next thing I want to do is figure out how I can control where this tooltip appears. You can see it's occurring just sort of to the right of the link itself, and I need a little bit more control over that. So I'm going to close my browser, go back into Dreamweaver, and I'm going to stay at the bottom of the page. I'm going to mouse over each of the Spry tooltips in turn and then click on this blue tab. That'll select the Spry tooltip, but more importantly, Notice that the Properties Inspector is now giving me a lot of options in regards to my Spry tooltip. Now, one of the first things I'm going to do is set a horizontal and vertical offset. Whenever somebody hovers over your trigger link, Dreamweaver is going to take a look at the offset values for horizontal and vertical, and it's going to move up and away from the current position of their mouse. So I'm going to do a horizontal offset for my first one of negative 200 pixels. That's going to move the tooltip. 200 pixels to the left. I'm then going to do a vertical offset of negative 290 pixels. That's going to move my tooltip up. So my tooltip is going to be moved up and to the left. I can also choose an effect for the tooltip, and I really like the fade effect. That's going to fade it in a little bit, and again, it's going to fade it out. We can also put a show or a high delay in, and I'm going to put a high delay of 500. That value is in milliseconds, so that means that after I mouse off of the link for the tooltip, the tooltip will stay up there for about half a second and then sort of disappear. It's also going to fade. We also have the option of having the tooltip follow the mouse. So if you were to move your mouse around within a link, the tooltip would follow it. We also have the ability to hide it if you mouse outside of the tooltip, but we're going to allow the link itself to control that functionality. So I'm going to leave both of those unchecked. I need to do that for each of these, but I have a slight change for the second one. I'm going to go up to my second one, and again, I'm going to click that blue tab right there. Brings it up in the Properties Inspector. And this time, my horizontal offset is going to be the same, negative 200 pixels. But the vertical offset is going to be negative 270 pixels. Why is that? Honestly, I don't know. As I was experimenting with those values, I noticed that the first one needed a slightly larger vertical offset than the others. It just happens that way sometimes. It might have something to do with the order that they're found within the code. Who knows, but the key is that you can come back in here and experiment with this as much as you want to ensure that you're getting the desired effect. I'm once again going to give it a high delay of 500 and then an effect of fade. Now I'm just going to be repeating that twice more. Tool tip 3, 
It's going to get negative 200 pixels horizontal offset. It's going to get negative 270 pixels of vertical offset. High delay is going to be 500. I'm going to fade that in and out. And then finally, my last tool tip, negative 200 pixels for the horizontal offset, negative 270 pixels for the vertical offset, and then a high delay of 500, and we're going to fade it out. I'm going to save that, preview that in my browser. Now when I hover over them, the tooltip is not showing up right on top of my link, and it's sort of over to the left a little bit. So that looks a lot better. It doesn't integrate with my design at all. There's no fixed width on these things. They're stretching out. They're hovering over everything. The typography and the color doesn't look right. So the last thing we need to do is go modify the CSS for these tooltips so that they look a little bit more integrated within our site. So I'm back in Dreamweaver now, and I want to go ahead and modify the CSS for this. Now, if I go over to my CSS Styles panel, and I think I'm going to collapse the Files panel just to give myself a little bit more room, I can collapse the main.css, close that down, and I see that there's my external spry tooltip.css. You know, there's really not a lot driving this. If you click on the dot tooltip content class, that is being applied to each of the div tags that contains the tooltip. The only property on that is a background color that's sort of a cream color. So what I'm going to do is go up to my tooltip content rule and double click that to open up the CSS rule definition dialog box. I want to make a couple of really basic changes here. My font size is going to change to 0.7 M's. My line height is going to be 1.6, and I'm going to do a multiple there. I'm going to go to a block category and do a text align of left so that my text won't be centered. Then I'm going to go to my box properties. In my box properties, I'm going to deselect same for all. I'm going to do 10 pixels worth of top padding, 10 pixels worth of right padding, 10 pixels worth of left padding, but I'm going to do 30 pixels worth of bottom padding. I'm also going to give it an assigned width of 320 pixels. Now, why in the world did I change it and give it 30 pixels worth of bottom padding? I did that because we're also going to apply a background image to our div tags. I'm going to go to my background category, and I'm just going to remove the background color itself. I don't want anything there. And for background image, I'm going to browse. Again, I'm going to switch to details so I can see a little bit better. And what I'm looking for is right down here, quote underscore box, PNG. This is a transparent pink file. It has kind of a blue sort of word bubble look to it, and then it kind of fades out as it gets taller. But you'll notice there's some space down here at the bottom. I don't want the text to come into this transparent area, so that's why we have all that bottom padding. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. For background repeat, I'm going to choose no repeat. And then I want to attach this to the right bottom of the parent element. That way, the bottom of the tooltip will always have that sort of word balloon down on the bottom of it. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And we can see right off the bat that our tooltips have changed. All right, let's do a Save All. Preview that in our browser. And test out your tooltips. Cool. Working exactly the way that we wanted them to. Well, as you can see, Spry content is incredibly easy to add to your page. And it's nice to know that Dreamweaver takes care of adding the JavaScript and CSS files to our site necessary for the Spry Contents functionality. The Tooltip widget is only one of the many cool Spry widgets available in Dreamweaver. I want to encourage you to take some time to experiment with the different widgets and play around with their settings and the CSS that controls them. You'll find that in no time you're going to be comfortable creating and deploying customized Spry widgets that integrate seamlessly into your site. The Spry UI widgets and form validation widgets are not the only form of Spry integration in Dreamweaver. Dreamweaver gives us a full set of Spry effects that can enhance your site's content through user interactions or controls. The reason that so many people don't know about Spry effects is because they're kind of hidden away in the behaviors panel, so most people don't associate them with Spry or realize how they can enhance their site's content. In this movie, we'll finish our photo gallery by adding a subtle fade effect when the larger images load. So I have the gallery file open. And I'm just going to scroll down to our gallery and select our larger image. So I'm going to go over to our Behaviors panel. Remember, it's usually docked with the Tag Inspector, but you can go up to Window and choose Behaviors if you're having a hard time finding it. So with my larger image selected, I'm just going to go to the Behaviors and click the Add Behavior icon. And I can see that I have a whole category of effects here. Well, these are Spry effects. They don't really fall under the traditional behaviors that the Behaviors panel adds to your page, 
because these are added through a spry effect.javascript file. Well, we're going to do the appear fade. And what I want to do is I want to target the current selection. Again, notice that we can target any element on the page with this effect, which is really cool. So you can have div tags that fade in and out, or images, really whatever you'd like. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is set the effect of the duration. I want that to occur for 1,500 milliseconds, so about one and a half seconds. And I want it to appear and not fade. And I want it to appear from 30% to 100%. Now, that's interesting. Why not go from 0 to 100%? Well, I have found that going below, say, 30 or 20% opacity tends to make the image look like it's flickering. Now, if you're trying to give the impression of maybe a camera snapping a photo or something like that, it's a really good effect. But as it is, I want a nice sort of subtle effect. So I'm going to stick with the 30%. Now we could also toggle this effect. What that means is maybe the first time it fades out, but the next time it fades back in. So if you have something where you want something to toggle based on user interactivity, that's a nice thing to do. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. I notice that this one has a default trigger action as well. And in this case, it's on click. I don't want on click. I want my images to fade in every single time they load. So I'm going to change that from on click to on load. I'm going to go ahead and save everything. Now, as soon as I do that, Dreamer is going to say, hey, wait a second. You also need the spryeffects.js. Is that cool? And in this case, it certainly is. I'm going to click OK. And I'm going to preview that in my browser. If I scroll down, every time I click on one of the thumbnails now, I can see there's that little fade in every single time an image loads. Cool. So spryeffects offer us another way to add richer user experiences to our sites. They're easy to use, and just like behaviors, they're easy to update or modify at any time. I encourage you to experiment with these effects to see how they can improve your site's usability and provide the subtle touches that separate good sites from the truly engaging ones. Although not technically a part of Dreamweaver, Adobe's widget browser gives you a quick and easy option for integrating Ajax widgets into your sites. The widget browser is a standalone Air application that allows you to browse Adobe's widget exchange and creates a collection of widgets that feature advanced user interface controls like sliding panels or accordion widgets or more complex components like slideshows or light boxes. To access the widget browser, you can go to the application toolbar, find the widget menu, and choose widget browser. Now, if you've never launched the widget browser before, you're going to be prompted by Dreamweaver to download it. So clicking OK is going to take you out to Adobe's website and you could click right here on the widget browser page to get the widget browser. Now, you're going to be prompted to sign in with your Adobe ID. And if you don't have one, they're really easy to get and they're free. So just sign up and you'll be able to download Adobe's widget browser. Now, after downloading the web widgets install file, all you need to do to install it is just double click on it. So here I have it right on my desktop, the web widgets air file. I'm just going to double click that and go through the installation process. So I'm just going to install this. And I'm not going to add a shortcut icon to my desktop, but I do want to start it after I install it. So I'm going to go ahead and click Continue. And it should install rather quickly. Once the widget browser is installed, you can use it to browse through Adobe's Exchange to see the available widgets. Now, as of this recording, everything is still in beta. So as you can see, there aren't a lot of widgets displayed here. This should change dramatically once the widget browser is released to the public. Adobe will continue to release widgets, and the browser allows users to package and share their own widgets as well. So as the community gets more involved, the number of available widgets will only continue to grow. Let's take a moment and explore how to use the exchange and how to get a widget onto your site. So I kind of like this Sprite Image slideshow. And if there's a widget that you want to add to your collection of widgets, you simply click on it. And you're going to be prompted by the widget browser to go ahead and sign in. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in to my Adobe account. And after you signed in, you're going to get a more detailed view of the widget that you were taking a look at. You can see ratings. You can see descriptions. You can see the type of license agreement. And if this is something that you want to add to your collection, you simply click Add to My Widgets. Now, as soon as you do that, you'll go through a little screen where you agree to any license agreements. And as soon as the widget is added, you can browse directly to your widgets. Now, you can also view your widgets by going up here to the menu and clicking on My Widgets. Now, currently, I only have the one. Now, what's really interesting about this is that if you click on one of these widgets after you've added them to your My Widgets section, you can see a preview of this slideshow in action. 
And you can see people can interact with the thumbnails. They can play the slideshow. And you can even take a closer look at the formatting for this. Now, in addition to being able to preview the widget, you can go right down here to the lower left-hand corner and click Configure. This is going to take you into a very detailed interface where you get to control every aspect of the widget. You can name the widget. You can change the duration of slides. In this case, you can modify titles. You can set physical size for the frames. Pretty much any option you can think of is directly controllable through this interface. So this is an incredibly powerful way to customize these widgets without having to write any code yourself. Now, if you change these, you can save them as a preset. And you'll notice that when I go back to the overview, I've already saved a preset for my Explore California tours. I've changed the title of this. I've changed the size of it, changed a little bit of the color on it. And that's a preset that I think is going to work well within my site. So I have the option here of saving these widget files out as external HTML and CSS and JavaScript files. But there's a better way to get these widgets into your files by using Dreamweaver. So I'm going to go ahead and close my widget browser and go back to Dreamweaver. Now, back in Dreamweaver, I've opened up the gallery.htm. I'm going to scroll down and click just below the paragraph where I want my photo gallery to go. Now, there are a couple of different ways to get your widgets onto the page. You can go up to the menu and choose Insert Widget, or you can use the Insert panel. You can go to your Common Objects, and there is our new Insert Widget icon right there. So if I click that, I get a menu that says, OK, which of the widgets that you have installed do you want to use? Well, I only have one currently, so I'm going to click the Spry Image Slideshow with Film Strip, and then any presets that I've chosen, I can go ahead and select. I'm going to select the Explore Tours preset that I created earlier, and I'm going to click OK. As soon as I do that, it's going to place the Spry Image Slideshow right on the page, and you'll notice that all these thumbnails have nothing to do with our photo gallery. They also have this little weird star out beside them. What's going on there? Well, if I switch over to Code View, I can see that the slideshow is really just an unordered list. So one of the things that's really nice about these new Spry widgets is they're very unobtrusive. They're just singular elements on the page without a lot of complex structure. So really, in order to make this slideshow my own, all I have to do is click on each of the image thumbnails and swap them out for an image in my site. So I'm going to close the tag inspector here just so I have a little bit more room. I'll open up my images, and I'm going to open up my gallery folder. So in the gallery folder, I'm just going to one at a time select one of these thumbnails. And using my source, I'm going to point that to one of my thumbnails. And to control which larger image displays with this, I'm going to use the link point to file to point to the larger image. So I'm just going to do that with each one of these guys. I'm just going to point to a thumbnail. And then using the link, I'm going to point to the larger image. Now, you're not limited by just the thumbnails on the page. You can add more if you'd like. So if you've got more images than the thumbnail, you can just keep adding as much as you want. This particular slideshow, for example, allows for you to have more thumbnails that can fit within the pane, and then it allows you to scroll through them if you've got more. Let me just go ahead and grab one more for this example. There we go. Now, you may have noticed that when we previewed our slideshow earlier, titles were coming up with the photo. So a lot of times, in order to understand how this is going to work, you do have to do a little bit of exploration. There weren't any instructions on the widget browser as to what we had to change. And it took a little poking around to find out that if I go into Code View, I can see that each one of these links has a title attribute. And the title attribute is the caption that displays. So I can simply highlight that and then type in the caption that I want for that particular thumbnail. So usually just examining the structure of the page will give you a good idea as to what you have to do in order to customize the widget to your own devices. Just a couple more of these guys, and we should be ready to go. Now, just like when we use our other Spry widgets on the page, as soon as I save this, Dreamweaver is going to add a lot of external files. Notice all of the graphics that it's adding. It's adding a lot of includes, a lot of JavaScript files. And when I click OK, I can see that I have a brand new directory in my site. And it's this Spry UI 1.7 that contains all of the CSS and all of the JavaScript in order to make the slideshow work. So if I'm going to upload that to my remote server, I need to make sure that that folder gets uploaded as well. I'm going to go ahead and preview this in my browser. So I'm just going to save all and then preview this in my browser. 
And as soon as I do, there is my slideshow with the thumbnails that I've loaded up. As you can see, the widget browser it makes it simple to add AJAX-driven controls into your sites. One of the really cool things about the widget browser is that it's going to be a community-based tool. As part of the Adobe community, you can browse widgets, rate them, and even package your own and add them to the exchange. So be sure to check the exchange often and participate in building a widget-based community. There are some things in life that just go together. In the world of web development, Dreamweaver and Flash have been partners for a long time. This lengthy relationship has led to some pretty impressive integration. Whether it's placing Flash content on the page, going back and forth between Dreamweaver and Flash as you work on your content, or integrating video into your website, Adobe has made the process seamless. In this chapter, we'll take a look at integrating Flash content onto your page, setting your Flash content properties, exploring Flash and Dreamweaver integration, and finally, integrating video into our website by using built-in Flash controls. First, let's take a look at the process of placing Flash content on your page. Integrating Flash into your website is as simple as having access to the Swift file. So here I have the mission.htm file open in the 1501 folder. And I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And we have an area down here on the bottom where we're going to place a banner ad. So I'm going to place my cursor right after the last paragraph and hit return. It's going to give me a little bit of empty space there. And there are a couple of different ways to insert Flash files into your pages. First, you could go to Insert, Media, Swift. You could also go to your insert panel and click on the media objects, and there's also the Swift option. Or you can go to the assets panel, and you could click on the flash assets. The assets panel is going to show you all of the different flash assets in your site. You'll notice that we see our Swift files or SWF files and not the FLA files. We could drag and drop these directly on the page, but we can also do that from the files panel. I'm going to switch over to the files panel. I'm going to go up to the underscore assets directory, and I can see in that file I have a banner ad underscore FLA and a banner ad underscore SWF. Now it's important that you understand the difference between the two. The FLA is the development file. That's the file that the Flash designer or developer is going to be creating your Flash content with. And the SWF or Swift file is the file that you're going to be placing on your page. So whether you use one of the methods from the menu or the insert panel, dragging and dropping from the Assets panel, or dragging and dropping from the Files panel, the result is going to be the same. So I'm just going to drag and drop from the Files panel. And when I release the mouse, Dreamweaver is going to prompt me for some object tag accessibility attributes. This is a good way to make your Flash content a little bit more accessible. And I'm just going to type in Banner Ad for the title of that particular movie. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And there is my Flash content on the page. Now, if I go ahead and save my file, you'll notice that Dreamweaver is telling me it needs to copy some dependent files over for us in order to make the Flash content run smoothly. So you can see it's going to add a scripts directory, and it's going to place an express install Swift file and a Swift object modify.js. I'm going to talk about what those do for us in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And I'm going to switch over to code view so we can talk about those external files a little bit more clearly. So all the code that you see on the page right now was generated by dropping that Flash movie onto our page. So why do we need so much code for something as simple as a Flash movie? Well, unfortunately, Internet Explorer doesn't play nice like some of the other browsers do. So in order to make sure that our Flash content is going to be viewable, we have to make sure that we're not triggering the ActiveX barriers that Internet Explorer can put up. That's where that external JavaScript file comes in. Now we have a lot of browser sniffing going on, and we can check to see which version of Flash Player people have, what version of the browser you have, and this express install.swf file goes ahead and makes it easier for your users to install Flash if they don't already have it installed. So this code is dealing with all the different browser types out there, making sure that the Flash file is visible within those browsers, and then giving your users options if the Flash file isn't visible such as installing or upgrading to the latest version of Flash. Now I'm going to switch back to Design View, preview that in my browser, and there is our Flash banner ad. And we can see there are a couple problems with it. It uh, just sort of is looping uncontrollably, and it sure does look like it's missing some content. So that's probably something we're going to have to deal with a little later on down the road. Now, as I mentioned before, it seems like an incredibly simple procedure. You're just dragging and dropping files onto the page. 
But between the ActiveX controllers, flash player detection, and browser sniffing that's going on behind the scenes, it is worth noting just how much work Dreamweaver is doing for you. Make sure you pay attention to the external files that are being added to your site. And I'm going to close my browser, go back into Dreamweaver, and once again, I'm going to highlight the scripts file that has our external files in it that Dreamweaver copied over for us. And when you upload your site, just make sure you upload those files as well and keep them in exactly the same location. That way, your Flash content is guaranteed to perform as advertised. Once your Flash content has been added to your page, you still have options regarding how that content operates and is controlled. Between controlling quality and playback options, you can have an impact on how the Flash file is viewed within your web page. So here I have the mission.htm file open from the 1502 folder. I'm just going to scroll down and select the Flash movie that we placed in our file in our last exercise. So looking down at the Properties Inspector, we can see that there are quite a few properties of the Flash movie that we can set here in Dreamweaver. For example, if we want to, we could maybe stretch this banner a little wider and maybe even shrink it down a little bit if it wasn't fitting the right size. Most of the time, that's not a really good idea. And as a matter of fact, if you take a look in the Properties Inspector, in the lower right-hand corner of all these properties, you can see a little play button. And you can click that to preview the Flash movie directly here in Dreamweaver. And you can kind of see what you've done to the file. Yeah, that's not a good idea. <laughs> so with some Flash movies, it's not that big of a deal, especially since they're vector artwork. So sometimes scaling them up and scaling them down doesn't really have an adverse effect on the file. In this case, however, it really tears the banner ad up and makes the artwork look just kind of odd. So I think what I'm going to do is go right back to my Properties Inspector, and I can click this little Reset Size icon that shows up whenever you modify those properties, and it'll take your Flash Movie back to its proper size. Now the next thing that the Property Inspector is displaying is the location of the Swift file itself, and also the location of the source file. So this would be the FLA file that was used to create that Swift file. Later on, as we explore the integration between Dreamweaver and Flash, that's going to be a very important feature. We also have the ability to affect the playback of our Flash file. Notice that we have a loop and autoplay feature, and those are going to pass parameters into the Flash movie that tell the Flash player to loop the content or not loop it, autoplay it or not autoplay it. Now, you need to be really careful about passing those values in. Number one, if whoever was creating your Flash file was doing some action script work, those parameters aren't necessarily going to overwrite the action script inside the Flash file itself. And if you turn autoplay off, then you need to give your users some method or means of playing the Flash content. If it's not already built into the file, you're not going to have those abilities. There are some options that are more just basic HTML properties, like vertical space and horizontal space. Those are the same types of attributes that you can set for images, and it'll push artwork away from the Flash content. It's a little easier, and it's actually a better approach to do that through CSS. Now, two other options here I want to talk about in a little bit more detail. One is quality, and the other one is scale. Notice if you grab the pull-down menu for quality, there it goes from low, high, auto-low, and auto-high. A lot of people are very confused by those settings, and they're not really sure what that's going to do. Well, those settings are going to affect the playback quality for vector artwork and text. If you feel like your audience members are going to have a really slow connection, or Maybe you have a lot of content on the page that's going to be playing back all at once. You could set the quality to low, and it would drop some frames, and maybe not smooth the artwork quite as much, but you'd get a better playback at that low setting. High or auto high is going to give you the best possible playback quality settings, with auto high adjusting for playback quality as well. I almost always use high or auto high, but if you're having trouble with your playback, you might want to experiment with some of the other settings. Now we also have a scale pull-down menu, and our scale can either be no border or exact fit. If this Flash movie were going to pop up in its own window, those two settings become pretty important. Now no border means that you're not going to be able to scale the Flash movie at all. You won't be able to resize the window, and you're not going to have any scaling. Exact fit, on the other hand, means that if somebody resizes the browser window that the Flash movie is in, the Flash movie will scale right along with it to fit that window. That could cause distortion, it could cause image quality to suffer if they scale it up too high, but it gives you that option, and that's especially useful if you have things like interactive maps or applications like that that you want people to be able to scale. Now, over here on the right-hand side of this, we have a parameter called window mode. 
Notice the settings for that are window, opaque, and transparent. By default, flash content is transparent. And if you place the flash movie, say, in a floating window or a div tag that was positioned using absolute positioning to float above other elements, if you say transparent, Dreamweaver is going to tell Flash not to render the background of the movie, and you'll literally be able to see through it. That's how a lot of the ads that we're seeing these days online with Flash are done. Notice that we also have opaque and window. Basically, both of those options are going to show the background color of the Flash movie and give you pretty much just the default viewing. Now, it is worth noting that not all browsers support the transparent windowless mode. So it's one of those things where if you're going to be doing that, it's a really good idea to have some browser detection in there so that you can present alternate content if that particular ad or application is not supported. There is one more thing that I want to show you about your Flash content within Dreamweaver. We have some Flash Player detection going on, and if somebody visits your page without the necessary version of the Flash Player installed, your page is going to provide them with some alternate content that suggests that they upgrade their player. Well, you have total control over the look and feel of that content. And we've got this little eye icon right here, and if we click that off, what I'm looking at now is the alternate content. You're free to go ahead and update this any way that you want. So please upgrade your Flash Player, anything you want to do. You could add anything to that. You could style it any way that you want. You could customize that so it sort of fit your branding or integrate it into your site a little bit better. And then as soon as you're done with that, you can just click that again, and it'll go right back to displaying your Flash content. So although we have a fair amount of control over our Flash playback in Dreamweaver, most functionality should be taken care of in Flash. So don't rely on Dreamweaver to provide you with mission-critical performance options. Keep in mind also that the transparent windowless mode that we were talking about does not work in every browser. So it's best to have a script that checks for browser compatibility and provides options for non-compliant browsers. Dreamweaver and Flash share one of the closest integration workflows among creative software. Once the Flash Swift file has been inserted into your web page, Dreamweaver creates a link to the original FLA file. If you need to edit a file, just use the Properties Inspector to open the original Flash file. While editing in Flash, you'll see an Editing from Dreamweaver icon. Clicking on that will save the file, republish your movie, and return to Dreamweaver with the updated Swift file. Let's take a look at that round-trip editing workflow. So we have our mission.htm file open from the 1503 folder. And I'm going to go ahead and click on the Flash file if I don't already have that installed. Now, I want to point out something about the exercise files and your Flash movies. When you place a Swift file on the page, Dreamweaver should automatically link to the FLA file that created it, as long as it can find it. So we do have the option of being able to use the point to file icon or the browse icon to assign an FLA file after the fact. In the course of copying exercise files, it's very common for Dreamweaver to get confused about which file it belongs to. So, at the beginning of this exercise, one of the things that I really recommend doing is going over to your Files panel, opening up this Assets folder where the banner add.fla file is, and just use the point to file icon to point to it and reestablish that link and make sure that you're editing the proper FLA file. It's also not a bad idea in your own Dreamweaver projects to occasionally check that and make sure that moving files around or editing files hasn't corrupted that link or caused Dreamweaver to look elsewhere for that file. You want to make sure that you're using the most current version of it. Okay, so with this selected, I mentioned before, and I'm just going to play it here to show you what I'm talking about. Our banner ad is animating, but it really doesn't have that oomph that we want. It just keeps looping, and there's nothing about our summer specials, our 20% off that we were supposed to see here. So obviously the Flash designer probably handed this over to us, a little early in the design and development process. Maybe they didn't get a chance to finish it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the round trip editing between Dreamweaver and Flash to go ahead and make those changes. So I'm just going to stop that. And with that selected, all I have to do is go right over here to the Properties Inspector and click Edit. Okay, so here we are in Flash, and you'll notice that we have in the upper left-hand corner a little editing from Dreamweaver icon. Now, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but I know that some of you guys viewing this title might not have Flash installed. If you want to experiment with this workflow, just go out to Adobe's website and download a free 30-day trial of Flash CS5. Install it, and you can come back and complete this exercise. Okay, one of the things we're going to do first off is to stop our movie from playing. And we're just going to do some really basic scripting work. 
I hear a ton of people right now going, scripting, not a chance. Well, it's really not that hard, trust me. So what I'd like you to do is this little panel right down here is called the timeline. And the timeline is really where we control all of our animations. And in terms of scripting, it's where we also store all of our scripts. So you can see the playhead, which is this little red line right here that you can pick up and move around. You can see the playhead is just sitting right there on frame 180. Go ahead and click on this keyframe. It's this little rectangle with an A above the circle right there. You just want to click on that one time to select it. When it's selected, it'll be highlighted. And that is the only frame you want to have selected. And you'll notice that this is our actions layer. So this is where we store all of our action scripting. And action script is the programming language in Flash. So we need to stop our movie. What I'm about to do next is open up my actions panel. Now on the PC, I can hit F9, but on the Mac, I can also hold down the Option key and hit F9. It'll open that panel up. If that doesn't work for you, you can always go up to Window and choose Actions. So my Actions panel is now open, and what I'm going to do is just click on the first line of code right here. This is our code pane, and I'm going to type in the word Stop. I'm then going to open a parenthesis, close the parenthesis, and type in a semicolon. I told you it was simple. <laughs> so Flash programming really isn't that hard. I'm going to close the Actions panel, and there's something else that kind of is bugging me. This Summer Savings 20% off should be showing up in our movie, but it's not. Well, if I look over at our timeline, I can see a layer here called Text. If I toggle the visibility of that on and off, I can see that's the text I'm looking for. Well, when I look at my layer types, I can see that this text layer is what we call a guide layer. And guide layers are layers where you place content that you don't really intend to publish. So maybe it's a layer where you're placing an image that you're using as a type of a template, or maybe you're putting something on there temporary with maybe the intention of using it later on. That's probably what happened here, and the designer probably just forgot to go in and turn this back on. So what you're going to do is go over to your timeline, right-click the text layer, and you can see there's a little check mark beside Guide. Click that, and you can see that that icon changes, and it's no longer a guide layer. Now, you might have been wondering, well, we've made all these changes. Do we have to save the movie? No, we don't. That's part of the beauty of this round trip editing between Dreamweaver and Flash. Now that we're finished making our changes, all that we have to do is go right up here to the upper left hand corner and click Done. That's going to save the file for us. It's going to publish the Swift file movie out again and make sure that we have the most recent version of that inside of Dreamweaver. So now in Dreamweaver, if I click the play button, now as the animation goes through, it's only going to play through one time. I see the text. And there's our stop action right there. So the banner ad is now doing exactly what we needed it to do. Now, if you're a Flash designer or developer and you need to update your files frequently, this integrated workflow is going to save you a ton of time. Switching back and forth between Flash and Dreamweaver becomes an orderly process and one that creates a seamless blending between the two environments. One of the most transformative events in the history of the web has been the introduction of video through Flash. Flash changed the nature of video online almost overnight. The ease at which Flash allows video to be created and deployed over the web is directly responsible for the recent explosion of online video. In showing how committed they are at easing the delivery of online video, Adobe has given Dreamweaver the capability to insert Flash video, or FLV files, directly into your site, even if you don't own or even understand Flash itself. Before we start using Flash video on our site, it's worth discussing how those FLV files are created. Almost every video creation and editing tool now has the capability of exporting FLV files. So if you're a video editor, you should be able to create FLV files from your favorite source editing program. If you're not, Adobe ships the Adobe Media Encoder with many versions of the Creative Suite and Flash. If you don't have it, you can download a free 30-day trial at adobe.com. We need to create two FLV files from one large QuickTime movie source file. We'll use the media encoder to create the files at the right quality for our site and trim one into a shorter segment. So I've launched the Adobe Media Encoder, and this program actually has a very deceptively easy interface. The reason I say that is if all you want to do is encode some movies, it's amazingly easy to just add files to the queue, hit go, and be done with it. But this application has a wealth of features just under the surface, and we're going to take a look at a couple of those. So I'm going to go right over here to the Add button, click on that, and find the source file for my FLV file. So we want to go to the 1504 Assets directory, 
and I'm going to find this podcast underscore teaser dot MOV. I'm going to click open, and we've added that one to the queue. Now, if I was fine with the default settings, I could just go ahead and click start queue, and it would create my files for me. However, you do want to very carefully inspect what's going on here. Notice, for example, that our preset is actually going to create an F4V file. Well, that's the new media format for Flash Media, and it supports the high-definition encoding. Now, that's certainly above and beyond what we need for ours, and it's not as compatible with some of the older Flash players. So I'm going to grab the pull-down menu for preset, and I notice that I have a ton of F4V presets and some FLV presets just below that. For my FLV presets, I'm going to choose Web Large, NTSC Source, Flash 8 and higher. So these presets give you an idea as to which version of the Flash player you're targeting. I'm going to go ahead and choose Web Large, and now I can see that I have an output file. Now if you click this, you not only get to name the file, but you get to choose the directory for it as well. So go ahead and click the output file, and inside the 1504 folder, find the underscore video directory, and I'm going to call this one podcast underscore teaser underscore LG for large. I'm going to click Save, and again, if I were ready to go, I could just start to queue at this point. Now, let's say I do need a separate version of this, maybe one that is shorter in length and maybe a lower file quality. Perhaps you needed a lower file size on a particular FLV file, or maybe you just needed a shorter segment. It's not uncommon to have to create several different FLV files out of the same source file. Rather than adding it to the queue again, notice that we can highlight this one, and we can just choose Duplicate. When we do that, we get another entry in the queue, and it starts off with exactly the same settings. So I can click the output file, and this time I'm going to change the name to underscore md for medium dot flv and save. Now I mentioned the fact that I need some slightly different settings here. So I can also grab the preset, and this time choose web medium. Now I didn't see anything here on our presets about shortening the length or customizing our video at all. So I'm going to go to this preset, and instead of just grabbing the pull down menu, I'm going to click this link. When I do that, I get an entirely different interface, and this one is incredibly robust. Now, it would take us a lot longer than we have in this particular video to go over every single setting here, so I want to hit some of the high points for you. One of the things that we can do over here in the upper left-hand corner is shorten our movie. So we can change the endpoints, and we can change the outpoints of our movie. So if I wanted to make this movie about half the size as it was before, just as a teaser clip, I could go ahead and choose exactly where to end that movie. The other thing that I could do is check all of my settings. I could check the encoding settings that I was using, the file type. In this case, if I click on the video tab, I can see that that default setting is going to resize that video. I don't want that. So I'm going to uncheck that and make sure it's using the source size. I'm going to click OK, and that's got me kind of concerned. I need to go up to my other preset, click on that, and check my video format as well. I see that one is resizing too, so don't take any of that stuff for granted. I'm going to uncheck that so that I get source size, click OK, and now I'm ready to go. So once you have all of your settings, you can just click the Start Queue button, and it's going to go ahead and begin to encode those movies. As your movies are encoded, you'll see a preview down here of the movie itself, and you'll get a progress bar that lets you know how far along it is. It moves surprisingly quick, especially on faster machines, but if you're queuing up a lot of videos, or some really big videos, you may want to make sure you have a little bit of time to kill as you're waiting for these videos to encode. Now, once the media encoder is finished, I'm going to go ahead and close it. I'm going to go back into Dreamweaver, and I want to open up that video folder. And when I do that, I can see right there are my two FLV files, large and medium, and now those are ready to be used in my site. The Flash Media Encoder is an amazingly powerful tool, but it's simple enough to use and comes with enough presets to deliver high quality video regardless of your experience level. Now that we have our FLV files, we're going to tackle integrating that video into our site in the next movie. Once you have your FLV files, adding Flash Video to your site is literally one click away. When adding an FLV to your site, Dreamweaver presents you with options on how your video player should look and operate. Although these options are limited when compared to developing video within Flash, I think you'll find them surprisingly powerful and adequate for most of your video delivery needs. So I have the index page open in the 1505 folder, and if I scroll down, I can see that I have an area right down here where our monthly podcast teaser video needs to go. 
So I'm going to click right in that empty spot between the headline and the body copy, and I'm going to insert our FLV file on the page. Again, there's a couple of different ways that I can do this. I can go to Insert, Media, FLV, or if I go up to my common objects, I can go to Media, FLV. So either way, I'm going to go ahead and choose to insert the FLV on the page, and when I do, I get a dialog box from Dreamweaver where I can set the properties for my Flash video. Now, you get two choices between video type, progressive download or streaming video. Unless you're using the Flash Media server or have a hosting service that is going to be streaming video for you, you're probably going to be doing progressive download. Progressive download is going to play back a video that's hosted on your server, but it isn't necessarily streaming. It is the most common form of Flash video delivery. I'm going to choose progressive download, and for the URL, I'm just going to browse for the source. So I'm going to browse to the 1505 folder, go in our video directory, and of the two, I'm going to use the large movie. So podcast underscore teaser underscore large. I'm going to click OK. And at this point, Dreamweaver is going to give us a couple of other options about controls that we can use, how those controls should look and behave. And one of the first things I want to do is detect the size of this movie. So I'm going to click detect size. That way it gives me a width and a height. And you'll notice that if I grab the pull down menu, several of these skins have a minimum width that your video needs to be. Now our video is 480 pixels, so we can really choose any skin that we want. Now, in reality, even though it looks like you have nine skins, in reality, you have three. There's the clear skin, which is a transparent skin that goes right over the movie. You have the corona skin, which is a slightly different interface look. And then you have the halo skin. Now between these three, you can usually find one that looks pretty good with your site. I'm going to choose the halo skin three. That's going to give me a play button pause button, a stop button, a seek bar, a mute button, and a volume bar. So that's pretty much the whole kitchen sink of your controls. Notice that these other versions don't have as many controls, so you can choose one based upon the amount of controls you need for your movie. We also have an autoplay feature and auto rewind. Autoplay obviously would start playing the video as soon as it loads. I'm not a big fan of that because, especially for a video like this where it's down the page a little bit, a lot of times the audio will start playing and somebody will wonder what's going on. They'll miss that impact of the movie. I prefer to let my users control when the video starts. Auto rewind means that when the movie's done, it'll rewind to the first frame of the movie. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. It's going to insert the movie on the page. Now, unfortunately, I can't preview this within Flash. So what I'm going to have to do is save the file. And had we not already integrated Flash into our site, we would have been prompted to go ahead and add the Express install and the external JavaScript file to our site. OK, I'm going to go ahead and preview that in Firefox. And as I do that, I'm going to scroll down. And there is my video with my video controls. I can press play. And notice that I can adjust the audio. The seek bar is working fine. I have a mute. And I have my pause, my play buttons. I can seek, and I've got my stop button. So my video is working perfectly. Now, I want to encourage you to experiment with some of the other video player settings. Choose a few of the other skins and see how they might fit your site's design. Flash Video Integration in Dreamweaver removes any barriers you might have had in delivering video to your audience. Obviously, bandwidth, audience, and overall site goals have a lot to say about whether your site really should feature video. However, if video is right for your site, Greenweaver makes it incredibly easy to implement.